Hi there, friends, and welcome to this uh, next in the Embracing series, Embracing Interfaith Cooperation. My name is uh, Tim Scora, and I'm here both as moderator of a group here in Chicago and as the writer of the study guide that you have there uh, in your hands, wherever you happen to be using this resource. The focus is interfaith, and we are very fortunate to have as our teacher this time, Ibu Patel, who lives here in Chicago and who will be introducing himself in a few moments, and then you'll have a chance to meet him in his teaching of these five sessions that you're about to enjoy here. Now, uh, there's a group of uh, eight of us sitting here this morning, and I'm going to ask them to each introduce themselves. Um, I'm delighted that we have a diverse group of uh, faith background and practice, and I want you uh, to have a chance to meet them before you actually hear them in dialogue and conversation with one another. So we're going to start over here with Karen, and uh, Karen, would you just say, would you introduce uh, yourselves to the group, and, um, and the folks back home will have a chance to meet you as well. So I'm Karen, I was raised in the Jewish tradition in a suburb of Chicago. Hi, I'm Maham Khan, and I am a Muslim raised here in the United States. I'm Ian Hallis. I'm a cradle-born Episcopalian, also from the north suburbs of Chicago. I'm Nick Price. I'm an evangelical Christian, and I work for a Lutheran church in the suburbs of Chicago. I'm Ibu Patel. I'm the founder and president of an organization called Interfaith Youth Corps, and I'm proud to say that uh, almost all of you have been through Interfaith Youth Corps programs and are alumni of ours, and I am an American Muslim. My name is Gautam Shrikishan, and I am a, um, uh, a spiritual seeker, actually, raised with uh, uh, Jain and Hindu roots, and I, am, I work at the Interfaith Youth Corps in Chicago. I'm Vicki Garvey, and I am an Episcopalian, though I haven't always been an Episcopalian, but it is my preferred um, place to be these days, and I am in Chicago. And uh, my name is Tim Scora, and I um, actually am a visitor from Canada. I live in British Columbia in Canada, and I'm a member of the United Church of Canada, um, and was also raised in the Episcopal Church, or the Anglican uh, Communion. Now, a word about uh, the format. In each of these five sessions, you're going to uh, have a chance to hear Ibu uh, teach for 10 to 12 minutes. And then uh, the group that's here will engage with Ibu with questions, with responses, reflection. And so what we're wanting to do is have the same kind of uh, interaction here in the group as we imagine you having, as we want to encourage you to have, wherever you may be. And so uh, we're going to begin with this first session. And the focus of this session <clears throat> uh, is interfaith cooperation in American history. Ibu. Great, thank you. So, uh, raised in the United States, uh, taking English classes and history classes, uh, I came to be very proud of and, and uh, deeply connected with the American tradition, right? And some deep ideas we have about uh, this nation and, and who we are. And one of those is the idea of America as an immigrant nation and people from all over the world, from Eastern Europe and from West Africa and from Northern Ireland and from South Asia have come to the United States and they've established their families and businesses and cultural practices and that's how America was built. And it came to be deeply connected to something called the American Dream, of course, which is you know this notion that um, you can have a big dream in, in America either for uh, the kind of person you want to be or the kind of business you want to build or the kind of uh, cultural practice or artistic endeavor you want to establish and you know we're filming this at the time of the Olympics and we're watching all these stories of of athletic dreams play out in front of us um, and and part of what I learned about America was this notion of course of freedom of religion is that you can come to the United States and the Puritans did this and other groups from the beginnings of this country and and you can have freedom of conscience you can establish your places of worship and you can pray the way you feel called to by, by God or by um, other super beings in your life or your consciousness. One thing that I discovered actually as a young adult and not so much in school 
right? Because it wasn't talked about as much in school, is this idea that interfaith cooperation or religious pluralism is also at the heart of the American tradition. Just as the American dream, one's own individual achievements, just as us being an immigrant nation, just as the idea of liberty of conscience are at the heart of the American tradition, so is the notion that people from different religious backgrounds have gathered here and established themselves in equal dignity and mutual loyalty. At Interfaith Youth Corps, we call this religious pluralism, and I think it's beautifully articulated by, uh, by Michael Walzer, uh, who is a political philosopher. He says that the challenge of the United States is to embrace its differences, in this case, its religious differences, and maintain a common life. And that way, the Muslims, the Jews, the Hindus, the Sikhs, uh, the Catholics, the Episcopalians, the Evangelicals who come here to the United States, they get to continue to be Catholic and Jewish and Muslim and Jain and Sikh. And at the same time, they're American. That that hyphen between Jewish and American isn't a barrier, it's a bridge. And what makes you a better Jew makes you a better American. And that's actually a really deep, powerful, in some ways unique idea. And Walzer, uh, this political philosopher that I'm, I'm referring to here, has this uh, story in his book, What It Means to Be an American. Uh, this notion that you know, for generations, centuries actually, political philosophers believed that the only way you could have diversity in a society was under dictatorship or under empire. Right? That if you had a democracy, a place where people participated in civic life, where people voted for their leaders, it had to be in a homogenous territory. Everybody had to be Catholic or everybody had to be Anglo-Saxon. And Walzer ends that section of his book and begins the next section with the words, except in the United States. And he says that we are the first nation to embrace this notion that people from the four corners of the earth could come together and build a country. Of course, this is the late 18th century. And we now are looking at a world where many nations do this. Canada, United Kingdom, South Africa, Kenya. America was really the first to say that Jews and Quakers and Anglicans and Puritans and Catholics and Muslims can come together in a single political entity and build that together. That is a powerful American tradition. And if you look back at American history, you see multiple times along the course of the last two plus centuries where heroes have lived that out. George Washington was not just our first president, was not just a great general, was not just the leader of the Continental Army. He was an interfaith leader. He secured the blessings of religious pluralism on American soil. I want to give you a couple of examples of this. The Continental Army, really the first national institution in America. It had contingents of soldiers from the various states and from various religious communities. And at that time, anti-Catholicism was at high and ugly levels. And one of the practices of people opposed to Catholicism was to burn the Pope in effigy. Now, what an ugly, prejudicial, biased practice. Washington banned the practice in the Continental Army. He sent a letter to his uh, fellow leaders in that army, and he said, we will welcome the Catholics coming and being a part of the American Revolution. And to burn effigies of their religious leader is so prejudicial and so biased and so ugly as to not be tolerated. Right? He said he would not tolerate that kind of prejudice. Why? Because he had a sense that the first national institution in, a, in what would become America, this continental army, had to be a place that welcomed the contributions of different communities. During the early days of his presidency, George Washington received a message from a Jewish leader of the Hebrew congregation of Newport, Rhode Island, a man named Moses Sessius. And Sessius was concerned about the fate of Jews in the new land. Would they be hounded and hated as they had been elsewhere for many, many centuries? 
And Washington took the opportunity of that response in a letter known in the annals of American history as a letter to the Hebrew congregation of Newport, Rhode Island to say that the government of the United States would give bigotry no sanction and persecution no assistance. That the children of the stock of Abraham ought to be able to sit in safety under their own vine and fig and there should be none to make them afraid. He ends that letter with these lines. May the Lord of all mercies scatter light and not darkness and make us useful in our several vocations and give us everlasting happiness each in his own way. That is a statement by our first president of the equal dignity and mutual loyalty between people of different religious communities sent to a Jewish leader. When Washington needed people to work on his estate at Mount Vernon, he made it very clear in a written statement that the people who came to work on that estate could be Jews, they could be Catholics, they could be Muslims, they could be people of no faith as long as they contributed. And that's really the genius of the beginnings of the United States. And of course now, as societies around the, country, around the world become more diverse, it has to be the genius of these societies as well. And as somebody who spent time in the United Kingdom, in South Africa, in India, and in Kenya, I see that blossoming. And I see that each of those societies has, as we do in the United States, these wonderful stories of Washington, they have their own stories of Gandhi marching with Badshah Khan, this great Hindu figure and this great Muslim figure for a free South Asia, or of Desmond Tutu, the great Anglican bishop of South Africa, working with the great Muslim figure Farid Esak. Right? Each of these societies, as they become more diverse and become political entities, have realized that a big part of who they have to be are countries in which interfaith cooperation is considered part of the waters of the tradition. I want to point out that it wasn't just Washington. Right? Benjamin Franklin helped to build a hall in Philadelphia and said that the pulpit of this hall will be open to preachers from anywhere. And if the Grand Mufti of Constantinople wanted to send a preacher to preach Islam to us, he would have a free pulpit in this hall. Thomas Jefferson reverently owned a Quran. James Madison said that the reason for the importance of the legal doctrine of religious freedom in America is precisely because we are a religiously diverse nation. And this was at our founding. But really throughout the course of American history, interfaith cooperation has been central. Jane Addams, who is a great American hero, citizen here in Chicago, she lived at a time of large-scale immigration of Catholics and Jews from Eastern and Southern Europe, and at a time of high anti-Catholicism and high anti-Semitism in response to that immigration. And Jane Addams insisted that those people coming to American shores, they weren't strangers. Judaism and Catholicism were American religions, and we should look to them as equal contributors. Around that same time, right here again in Chicago, 1893 Parliament of the World's Religions, welcomed Buddhist leaders, Muslim leaders, Hindu leaders, Catholic leaders to its podium. One of my favorite lines from that Parliament of the World's Religions is that it says that from now on the great religions of the world make war no longer on each other and instead on the giant ills that afflict humankind. I want to close this session this, um, with, with the image of Martin Luther King Jr. right? Uh, who we all recognize as a great civil rights leader, as a great African American leader, as a great leader of nonviolence. He was also a great interfaith leader. He was also somebody who is part of the heritage of interfaith cooperation in America. He was somebody who learned nonviolence from Mahatma Gandhi, the great Hindu figure. He was somebody who reached out to the rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel and marched with that great rabbinic figure in Selma. He was somebody who had a correspondence with uh, the venerable Thich Nhat Hanh, the great Buddhist monk from Vietnam. And I want to end this session with a line of Martin Luther King Jr.'s. Uh, after he had gone to India 
and experience the religious diversity of that country in 1959. He comes back to his pulpit in Montgomery, Alabama, and he preaches on Palm Sunday in 1959. Oh God, we call you this name. We know some call you Brahma. We know some call you Allah. We know some call you Elohim. We know some call you the unmoved, the unmoved mover. Let us take that heritage of interfaith cooperation, recognize that it is a key story in the American tradition, and commit ourselves to writing the next chapter in it. Mm -hmm.